So I'll do a little bit of housekeeping while Marjorie's passing stuff around. Um, there are some images in this slide deck, but most of them are decorative or the context is already going to be said or on the, um, yeah, been verbally uh, said. So we won't be describing any images unless we have to, um, because this is actually a three hour workshop that we submitted and then they told us we had a 50 minute slot. So there's a bonus section at the end if we have time on like how to write a little bit of markdown, but we have our link to the slides there. If people want to follow along, there's some, there's some resources to good markdown editors. And then um, also you'll be able to see that section on markdown and we'll add to it tomorrow. If we run out of time, you can do those bonus slides at home. And that's a bitly link bit.ly DrupalCon hyphen writer hyphen workshop. And I am Amy June, Aaron Winborn Award winner 2021. But um, I'm going to describe my image because I'm wearing a Drupal Camp Asheville shirt. And Drupal Camp Asheville is July 7th through 9th in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. And one of the things that me and Marjorie did in a past lifetime was we were um, editorial managers for some very popular open source and architectural magazines online. They no longer exist, but Drupal Camp Asheville has a neurodiversity initiative where we understand that not everyone likes to present their content verbally through a presentation, so we're accepting articles. So if you, an article comes out of this, you free, feel free to submit it to Drupal Camp Asheville. And that's Marjorie Freeman. She has not won the Aaron Winborn Award yet. Yet. All right, so thanks for having us, everyone. Um, so I made this presentation, we, we made this presentation a while ago, but I added some notes to it because I met somebody yesterday who asked me um, why we were having a writer's workshop. And usually I have, um, you know, I have this elevator pitch of why we do this, and when we worked at Red Hat, it was because we want to encourage people to write and write for our sites. And he was like, well, how do you encourage people to write when there are things like ChatGPT and other natural um, language processing tools? Like what makes somebody writing um, you know, for themselves different than just using a tool? And I was like, there, there's a certain human touch that comes with being able to write about your expertise versus using a tool for it. And um, as a community advocate, there's nothing more gratifying than helping someone um, write their first article. So that is why we give these workshops. And um, we hope you can leave with something helpful. And oh, so why this workshop? You know, um, Marjorie already talked about us being community advocates. Sorry, I'm not in the microphone. <laughs> Um, we're here to help you find your why, your what, and your words. Um, because sometimes, because we have this workshop sort of broken in two parts. One's about technical articles and the other's about documentation. And the technical articles some people struggle with because they just don't know where to start. So we're going to help you look for that how, what, and why. Um, so why do we write? Well, we want to share our information and our expertise with people. Um, we want to share our information. We want to promote our projects. We want to promote open source. Um, perhaps, you know, the job market's kind of weird right now in tech. You need to build a personal brand. You know, you publish an article. That's something that you can have on your LinkedIn presentation. It's something that you can, you know, have on your resume. And we all know that when you teach something, you learn something. You learn by teaching people. Um, and then also we want to create more experts. So uh, this slide's just up here for the QR code if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, these are at the end too. 
Um, so we're just going to pass because we already kind of talked about ourselves. And there's Marjorie's QR code. Do you have anything else you want to say about yourself? No? Okay. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to do a little bit of a brainstorming activity. It's going to be kind of a flash brainstorming activity because it's a very uh, abbreviated workshop. So again, finding those words, the what, the why, the five W's and the H, remember that weird H, the how, um, to kind of pinpoint and look at what you're going to say. So um, like I said before, we're going to do technical, technical articles and documentation because they're written differently. They have the same kind of information, almost exact, but they have a different flow. And then if we have time, we'll look at the basics of Markdown, because Markdown is a spectacular language that is human readable, but can convert your stuff to HTML easier. And as editors, we really appreciate when your articles are not in a Google Doc and in Markdown. So think of that. But then, you know, Markdown's going to be in the next Drupal release I heard in the CK Editor 5, so that's kind of exciting. So might as well learn it. Okay. <clears throat> First, I want to talk a little bit about um, why we haven't written. You know, perhaps you know you're from an excluded community, or you don't feel you have the skill set. So I'm going to just kind of breeze through some common myths. That way, you know that other people might feel this way, and then I want to talk about why they're really myths. Lots of people won't write because they don't think that they're an expert. You don't have to be an expert to write. Everyone has a different idea of what expert means, um, and no one knows everything, and everyone has something to learn. You could know more about your topic than someone else, and then your life experience on that same topic is going to be different than the life experience of someone else. Myth two, people will make comments on my articles or in the issue queue and ask questions I can't answer and I'll look like a fool. People might ask you questions, um, and that's okay, you know, but most of our readers understand that not everyone knows everything. You have failed if your page views are low. If you reach three readers today, that's three more readers than you reached yesterday. And what they take away, you might not know. That's 300% markup. You know, you've enriched and you've bettered three lives. And then we have myth four. We get this a lot when we, when we solicit articles, is how to is the only format used to share my knowledge. There's all different types of articles that you can do. And I don't know if we go through the different types because we don't have time. But there are more than just the how to's. So the hardest part about writing is actually starting, and there are resources to help. And we'll show the slide at the end. So there are opensource.com and Enable Architect no longer exist, whatever, but we do have other places where we found that are good for submitting our technical articles. There's sysadmin signal, where they talk a lot about the sysadmin kind of culture. Um, as a contributor, you can expect editorial services, technical reviews, final approval, uh, you can have final approval of your uh, uh, article before it's published. And if you have a topic you want to cover, or you want to contribute, um, there is a email address up there. And again, you know, we had those, the links to the slide, and I think we have them at the end too. Technically Rewrite is from one of my writers in the open source uh, community that he decided since opensource.com no longer exists, he's going to start a website. It's a community of technical writers, technical editors, copy editors, and web content writers, um, and they would love to share everyone's story. Your article can be anything related about technology, such as tools, tips, how to get started, what you've learned, and all kinds of other topics. And I mentioned Drupal Camp Asheville, July 7th through 9th in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. We have the initiative, and there's the link there, Drupal. Asheville.com, submit an article, and there, there's a little bit of a process and a form to fill out, but we will welcome reviewing your first article. Okay. And then there's the Drop Times, um, a new kind of magazine that we have. I don't have too much information. I just know that you can do info at the droptimes.com. Okay. All right. So getting started, finding your why, your what, and your words. So 
A story is comprised of a beginning, a middle, and an end. They don't always start with once upon a time, but they should always leave the reader wanting to stay until the end. In this section, I'm going to share how to pinpoint what you're trying to say, why you think it's worth sharing, and how to make your voice better heard. And we hope that the tidbits that we share will help you do just that. So Amy June is going to go over some prompts, and that's why I passed out the notebook and the pen. Again, we're going to breeze through these, but they kind of give you a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a starting point. So when we do the hows, what's, and why's, you can look and kind of refine your stuff. So first, we're going to um, help you answer the question, I don't know what to talk about. I don't know enough to talk about it or write an article. I'm not an expert in anything. you know. Um, so we're going to do this brainstorming exercises, and you can write down as many topics as you want. It'll be brief, but you know, just we're not looking for good. We're not even looking for we're, we're not looking for perfect, and we're definitely not looking for good. We just want the big, the bad, and the ugly. You know, all the stuff that you got in your mind. Just brain dump it. Um, you can draw. You can do mind maps. That's why we passed out the little. Uh, uh, card books, um, while you're summoning your inspiration, getting writer's block or anywhere in between, we'll be doing these prompts to kind of help you get started. And remember, it's always good, especially if it's your first article or your first piece of documentation, to write about what excites you. It's a little bit easier when you have a little bit of passion behind your project. So the brainstorm. And these are Drupal specific. Um, what is your favorite module or theme? Or version of Drupal, because we have till 2025. What cool tricks do you use all the time? So remember, the tricks you use, someone else might not know about. What cool thing have you created? What is the last thing you learned and how did you learn it? What do you want to learn next? What is the biggest challenge you've ever had with Drupal? And how did you overcome that biggest challenge? So think of like case studies. We'll add some more of these prompts to the slide deck because we usually, like I said, it's a longer workshop. So we'll put more prompts in the slide deck that tonight so you can look at it in the future and kind of get a few more ideas. Cool. All right. So now that you have those written down, um, 
we'll go over, well first I'll talk about the five W's and the H, and then I will go over a sample passage that you can use some of the ideas that you wrote about and kind of walk through identifying your W's and your H. So um, many of you probably learned about the five W's and an H in elementary school, but I'll just go you know, over them really briefly again. So your who, your, your what, is what it is you're talking about. So the tool um, or whatever subject you're trying to tell your specific audience about. Um, your who is your audience. And your when and where is tricky because it can also be a how, but it's also like what circumstances would you use or would somebody use X, X being your what. Um, why should they even be reading about this tool? Why are you writing it and why do you want people um, to know it's so important? And then how can they use it? This is going to make up most of your body text. How are they... How is this going to benefit them? How do they implement this? Um, what challenges did you experience while you were working with it, and how can they overcome it? So I will show, go through a series of slides that will show the what, the who, the when, the where, and the why, and then I'll just kind of open it up and see if anybody can identify um, each part of the passage. It's OK if nobody speaks. But if you would, that would be great. So there's not like that awkward, uh, OK, I guess I'll go to the next slide, but no pressure. Um, OK, so the what is what are you sharing about? Um, and I'll go to the next slide, and then I'll ask if anybody can actually identify the what in the passage. So I know everybody can read, but I'll read it anyway. Um, we are technical community advocates, and we enjoy using Markdown to help expedite the editorial process for our communities of writers. Markdown helps lower certain barriers to entry by masking the complexity of technical writing and bridge the gap between technical writers and developers. It is straightforward, and anyone can get started today. So what are we talking about in this passage? Markdown. Yay! Um, that was easy. Thanks for answering, so I didn't have to. Um, so who? The who is who your article or summary or your idea is targeting. So in the following passage, just call out who you think the who is. Who? OK. I got scared. I was like, oh my god, do I have to highlight it? Who, um, so who is Markdown intended for? And when I was writing this, I was like, who exactly are we talking to? But I'm curious to know if anybody can pinpoint it. Right. Writers. And then I had really small, I highlighted technical writers, but in general, we're talking about writers so you guessed correctly and then why do we suggest using markdown I said to sorry typo for our writers um, and can you identify the why in the following text <laughs> Are you using Markdown right now? I am not using Markdown right now, but but we'll talk about it later. And I feel like I don't want to doubt myself. Go ahead. Okay, I'm up for debate on this one, but I actually put masking the complexity of technical writing just because. That is why I'm recommending Markdown for writers. But I think, well, what, it could be any. It could be your point of the why. Your yeah, why might be different than Marjorie's in this one. Yeah, and that's. I mean, I guess that's another point. Like, why 
are you writing about markdowns? Amy June, do you have anything to add to that? Like every every article is subjective, right? So everybody's why is gonna be different. So yeah, but that's why I put, um, we recommend markdown for writers because it helps us in the editorial process. And then the where and the when. When and where would we use markdown or suggest using it to writers? This can be another way to explain how your subject will be used. So when do you think, when or where would we use markdown? When or, when or where would Amy June and I as technical advocates use markdown? Exactly, yeah. I was confusing myself. I forgot we were talking about me and you, not the actual writers, yeah. Um, so yes, the editorial process. And then this is where you define the application of your what. So this will be like the actual meat of what you're trying to talk about. This is usually what prompts someone to want to read your article. Um, on our editorial team at Red Hat, we had an SEO team that specialized in optimizing articles for search. And the how is definitely a section where you'd want to be as descriptive, but as concise as possible, so people can pinpoint exactly what they came there for. So the how might be a, a, the section on Google that comes up in the results if somebody like search for whatever, like that might be the, the summary under the, the URL. So you wanna make sure that you have a section in your article that clearly states um, or introduce us how this tool is going to benefit um, the reader. So can anybody um, pinpoint how we're, how Markdown would work in this context? And again, there are probably multiple answers and I think I heard somebody say it earlier. And I think, I think there's much up for debate between the bridging the gap and um, lowering the barriers to entry. But if you guessed, um, if you guessed this, that's that's what I had. So that's that's as right as it's going to get. But again, it's subjective based on who you are and uh, who you're intending to reach through your article. But ultimately, no matter where you are in your writer's journey or um, understanding what you're trying to say is the first step and you can just keep building from there. And at the end of the day, if your audience understands why you're writing or speaking, if you're at a conference, um, about a particular topic, um, you're on the right track. So, and now, we'll get into, now that you have your uh, your who, what, when, where, and why, and your how written out, this is where you figure out, okay, what exactly am I wanting to write? So when people think of technical writers, they may think of experts who specialize in um, you know, tech, technical documentation and translating highly technical subjects into digestible formats, but Anybody who is an expert on a certain subject can be a technical writer because they, they own that knowledge. And if you know how to parse that information and translate it, then you own that subject. So um, in this section, we're going to define what technical articles are and how they're different from documentation, which is something um, a technical writer or a subject matter expert or practitioner might write because that's what you are. So technical articles or blogs are um, an informal way to share about your technical expertise. It doesn't have to be about technology per se, but it can be about the logistics, practice, or science behind any topic that requires um, a fundamental understanding or to grasp or undergo. So 
when Amy June and I were working with our different communities, um, we there was a certain process that we would use to help coach mainly new writers who were new to publishing about what they do. Um, and generally, we tell them to start with the three steps it would require to do the thing, so write that down. Um, and if there are more than three steps, that's fine. That could turn into a great follow-up article. But um, you can actually build on these steps and write sub-steps, sub which would go on to inform the body text of your article. But if you can pinpoint the three points that you really want to say, you have the rest of your article. You just have to flesh it out. So um, once you have those three steps written out, you can actually form your introduction and your conclusion there. Sometimes it's tough for me personally to start out with the introduction because it's like that is the point where you want to have people glued in, but you can't have people glued in if you don't know what you want to say. So write down the three things that you want to say. Use that to inform that first paragraph that's going to catch people's attention. Once you have that, and you have the introduction and those three steps and the sub steps, you can write your conclusion and that will be like your call to action. And I have, I have something I wanna tag on to that. Um, that beginning paragraph, it's kind of important to make sure that you're leading your readers in the right direction. They know what to expect out of the article and you're not giving them anything like clickbait kind of stuff. So make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, that's why it's important to kind of do that at the end. You know, you want to introduce the topic because what if it's a 14 minute read? They're going to look for some stuff and it's not there and they're probably going to, you're probably going to lose your content consumer halfway through if some of that stuff wasn't in that, in that beginning paragraph. That's a good point. Um, and just to illustrate it, um, I took one of opensource.com's um, which is still up, so you can still actually go and see this. Um, an article, a very recent article written by uh, Ahmed Sabo. Um, and um, he, I don't know, I, I thought this was a very good template for getting started. So he has his three intro paragraphs, and he introduces his three um, main points in the introduction. And I couldn't screenshot the entire article, but you can see he has his three bullets here, and then his body text is going to go into more detail about those three bullets, and I just made them up here. But this is an easy way to kind of format your thoughts, and of course, every article is going to be different, but if you're just getting started, this is an easy way to, um, to structure it. And I included the link at the bottom if you want to check it out. And I'll let Amy June talk about documentation. Okay, so there's this website called Indeed. No big deal. Um, but according to Indeed, technical documentation is more formal writing style um, that describes the application, the purpose, the creation, or the architecture of a product or service. It's a little bit different than telling your story in an article. Um, there are many different types of documentation, and we're just going to list them for the sake of brevity. Um, we have tutorials. We have how-to guides. We have product manuals. Sometimes they're called man pages. We have reference material. We have project plans. And in Drupal, if we're lucky, we have readmes. Okay, so the, talking a little bit about the difference between the, the articles and the documentation itself. Um, we want to be clear, concise, and succinct. We want to eliminate words. We want to be careful of jargon, buzzwords, pop culture references, and more specifically, we want to eliminate those words that do not directly enhance or support the purpose of your document design. No sparkle, no rainbows, nothing. 
this is the point of technical documentation. You want to have it be as clean and concise as possible. And remember, with something like Drupal, we're a global market. So the more concise we are, the easier it is for everyone else, the easier it is to translate. And remember, those pop cultures terms or those buzzwords don't translate in other languages and cultures. So you want to use specific nouns. You want to, words like things, kind of nebulous, you know, they should be eliminated from your technical writer's lexicon. Um, lack of nouns, uh, spe specificity uh, uh, can, be, can cause confusion. People are not quite sure what the point of your sentence is. So what things specifically? What people? The sentence lacks meaning because of vague nouns and um, kind of forces the reader or the writer to add extra sentences to clarify the confusion. So when you add, when you don't specify your nouns, it, no, you're no longer um, concise and succinct. Um, it, we also want to strengthen verb phrases. Verbs are the heart of your sentence. You know, it's that do action, right? When you water them down, when you make them less, you know, uh, when you just, you know, they kind of turn into mud. So. Um, they get weak and they lead to confusion. Um, so active voice, and I struggle with this one, active versus passive voice, but we always want to use the active voice when we're talking about uh, uh, documentation. And it's more accessible to use active voice. Um, active voice means that the subject of the sentence is doing the action, while passive voice means the subject is being acted upon. We want to break up our walls of text. We don't want huge walls of text. We want to break up our content. Um, each point should be um, brief and easy to understand. So use bullet points or numbered lists. Um, they help to prioritize the information and break down those walls of text. Because you know some of us are on our phone and we have those big long walls of text. No one wants to read, they want to scan. So those bullet points are really important. We want to make sure that we organize our content in a way that makes sense, a logical flow. This is accessible too. Um, so to ensure that your documentation is clear and understandable, it's important to organize it logically. This means presenting the information in a structured way that makes sense to your readers. So you might have to refine this as you go and look down and maybe even have someone review it. Do the steps make sense in the order they are? The last one is if your team has a style guide or like Drupal, you know, we have a style guide, you want to follow that style guide. You know, you want to take time to familiarize yourself with it and reference it when you have questions. Um, it, it really, it provides those guidelines that you need for consistent writing. And we don't want every readme to have a tone and a voice that's different. We don't want it to be in Chicago on one page and APA on another, okay? And some accessibility tips that come along with, um, with uh, writing. We want to define acronyms. We want to define numerims. And we want to define abbreviations. So the first time you use I18N, you tell it what it is, put it in parentheses, and then the next time you reference it, internationalization, you can do I18N. Accessibility, A11Y. And then you can put A11Y throughout. And the reason we do this is because it's not everyone is, is privileged to have um, some of those acronyms um, in their lexicon. And, BLM, is that Bureau of Land Management, or is it Black Lives Matter? So little things like that. We want to use predefined reading levels. Um, Usability.gov recommends that we write at the ninth grade reading level. But remember, if you have a global audience, your, your reading level might need to be lowered. We want to use clear fonts and avoid special characters. And this is more for the technical writers sort of thing, because in read means, you know, usually we render it as, as text. But um, the special characters, and the last one's avoid emoticons and ASCII art, goes along with these special characters. Everyone kind of loves a good emoji, right? But screen readers love them a lot. 
and they read every single one of them. And so for someone like who uses a screen reader, it's annoying. And it's just not necessary when we do our documentation. I see a lot of people adding emojis in their readmes these days, and it just doesn't make sense for accessibility. It doesn't make sense. And it adds those rainbows and sparkles and things like that. So some bonus tips. We want to make sure that we write to one person. Um, we want to use singular. We don't want to do we or let's, us. We don't want to use pronouns. Um, we want to make sure we write as if our reader is doing the task on their own. So no will, should, or could sort of verbs either. Write for one clear result. This means teach, persuade, perhaps enlighten, you know, on those technical articles. One idea. And then try typing your topic into search to see what other people are saying about it. You know, just curious, right? And then we also say to use Markdown. So Marjorie's going to talk about some takeaways. Again, sake of brevity, this is a little bit uh, abbreviated workshop. Yeah. And I'll also add to the, the last slide about typing in your topic into search. It's a great way to inform your headline, too. So um, how to use Markdown. That's a great headline because I guarantee you somebody has typed that into Google, and it just increases your chances of your article um, being found. But uh, five important takeaways. Um, direct your article to the readers and not the curators. Um, so don't, don't do what I did with the, the passage. Uh, <laughs> think about who it is that, who it is that's reading your, your um, article and just assume that, like Amy June said, that anybody is going to stumble upon it. So somebody with tons of technical knowledge or somebody who is just starting out in their journey, make sure that you're not assuming that your people in your space are the only people that are happening upon your article. Um, pose the question your article will answer in the intro. Um, make your point as succinctly as you can. Reference material, so you want to um, back up any resources or um, any supplemental reading that will help further your, your why or why you're writing. That just adds to your credibility. Um, and use proper grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Um, my managing editor was my hero because grammar is uh, a tough one. But uh, it just, again, it just adds to your credibility and you don't want anyone to read your article and be like, um, well, there's a couple misspelled words. It takes away from why you wrote in the first place. And it can distract people when there's a lot of that sort of action going on. Yeah. And Markdown. Okay. So are we at time? Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about Markdown, and then we're going to open up for questions. I didn't do a whole lot of slides about Markdown. I have a favorite thing, and I forgot to put it in there. I love to write tables in Markdown. So look it up. Tables are really cool. You can justify them. They, tables are scary for some folks, but they're really kind of straightforward to do. Again, forgot to put it in here. So why Markdown? And I like to iterate on this a lot. Um, it's simple, it's intuitive, it can be ver converted to HTML, PDF, or other formats um, by using just a couple of tools and platforms that are pretty um, standard across our industry. So think of using Markdown like you're using your editor without, without using the buttons. All of those WYSIWYG buttons that you have, you, most of those that you can write in Markdown. So have you ever maybe y'all are more technical than me, you like submit a session somewhere and it's just a box and you're like, oh, where's the bold? Where's the whatever? Usually those boxes will take Markdown. So start with an MD file, not a text file, because an MD file is going to tell your editor how to render it. So um, 
in Drupal 7, we saw a lot of readmes.txt, but as we, extend, as we expanded um, how we wanted the formatting to go in the templates, we now really encourage it to be in an MD file. So MD helps re your editor um, render that out in Markdown. Um, and the plain text files just don't allow that kind of formatting, you know, like the headings and the subheadings and the bolds and the italics, and markdown format does. Um, they're kind of between a text file and a markup language like HTML. They're sort of that in-between. Um, know your flavor of markdown. There's a lot of different flavors of markdown out there. GitHub has one flavor of markdown that may not work in a, in a, in a different editor, so Pick your flavor and kind of stick to it. I kind of think that these markdown, di uh, different types of markdown is like different dialects. I don't know why, but they're just, just different enough. Find a good editor. Um, my best advice for folks who are looking for a good editor, you don't need a huge IDE when you're a technical writer, right? Um, but take your time and find out which one you like the best, you know, which plugins does it have, which, um, you know, uh, how, does it, how does the UI look? Is it accessible to you? This is a list of links. So if you did get that link to the slide deck, these are some markdown editors that I particularly write, like. Um, I like VS Codium a lot. You know, it's a VS Code, but open source. All of these are open source. Joplin's a real good one. I saw someone taking a picture. Did you get your shot? Okay. And then, again, abbreviated session. So this is me and Marjorie, again, um, are linked in. And an, if anyone has um, visual-induced um, uh, motion sickness, if you want to close your eyes, I'm going to split back to the top of the um, deck real quick, and I don't want anyone to get sick. Because I want everyone to have that link. the bit.ly link, and we'll add more of those markdown. I'll do the whole table slides and that sort of stuff. But does anyone have any questions for us? Sure. When you say you avoid special characters, does that mean like, like, like uh, in dashes, m dashes, that sort of thing, or is it like pound sign? Like yes, so the question was, what specifically do we talk about when we talk about special characters? So special characters can be M dashes, they can be percent signs, they can be ampersands, um, they can be... Um, so yeah, because screen readers don't always read them the same, you know? Um, of course, you have to have them sometimes, right? But if we can avoid using an ampersand when we can use the word and, you know, and we, you know, sometimes the ampersand messes up your markdown too, right? You know, you got to eject the characters. I have to have her repeat the question for me. There is a she asked if there's a way to use Markdown in Google Docs, and there is an extension to Markdown. Okay, so the you're in Google Docs and you want it in Markdown. Okay, so there is an extension that you can use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I answer that one? Go ahead. So I'm more opinionated, and I can talk about this for a long time. Marjorie worked on a different website than I did, Enable Architect, and I worked on opensource.com. So for me, opensource.com, we only talk about open source. 
those machine generated words are not open source. Someone else owns that languaging. Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. It's I a mean, very I've, tricky one. I've used it before because I'm not. I had to write an article really quickly for uh, what was it on an open RAN. I don't know nothing about RAN, but it needed to be you know it needed to be published. Um, and I used my own knowledge base and combined what I got from Chat GPT and. It was a lot better than if I spent a month trying to write something that somebody could turn out in a, a day. Um, I, I would just say it depends. I don't know. That's a tricky one. I can't and answer that question. Our technical community advocate, when Ch Chat GPT first started, he could tell yeah, that it was machine so. written. You know, and that's the thing too. You know, there's the as much as we say you don't have flavor, you do have tone and voice in a technical article. Mm -hmm. So I wish I could pull that article up. Yeah, but yeah. I think somebody that has that expertise could probably tell that this was kind of fudged. And and there was a lot of fact check checking he had to do too, <laughs> which he does anyway because when we published, we went through every single thing to make sure it was technically correct. But a lot of um. Fact checking. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Would you just not use that as a first draft and then like continue on? Um. Yeah, I mean, you you definitely could, and the process that we use, like Amy June said, our technical advocate would just go through and be like, maybe we should reword this or to make but, it sound a little more human. But you know, there's another side to it too. Like the blank page is really scary, so having that, but knowing the wisdom. To change it around and like you know what I mean do that but sometimes it does help people with that first maybe the first paragraph yeah. or get to their point you know they could be you could ramble into it and it will come up with something you know but definitely change it up it's a good idea starter and it depends on what if you are going through a, an editorial process as well if you're just writing this for LinkedIn it's a little different but um, what I loved about our team was I could help somebody just if they just had like a passage like I had up there, I could help them write their paragraphs. Like not write it for them, but say like, hey, just write a sentence and let's jump on a call or let's get on a Google Doc and talk about it. But uh, ChatGPT is great or all the other processes. It's great for getting the idea started, but it's not your voice. And you just get better by learning how to do it yourself. So. And, and remember, most of our projects are open source. Yeah. So if you add some text that's not open source, are you open source anymore? So there's a lot of okay. there's a lot of nuances. So yeah. I think Dave said we were at time. Do we have time for one more question? Go ahead, John. I had a question around the write for one person, you need to say you learn everything. Um, so I'm also like, should I be using you and your? Is that what, what that is saying? The user. Oh, so the question is, should I be using you and your to go on the singular? And you really shouldn't use any kind of pronouns. It should be the user. Can you use they? Can you even use like? Well, you're, you shouldn't the, use pronouns. You should like direct it to the. Just a general. Yeah. Like, like, so like, um, I, I want to say you should make your website accessible. Okay. Yeah. And should I be saying developers should, like my intent and like developers should make their website accessible? I think in that case you could do both, but I would use developers personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you don't because you're being specific about statement. the user too. Yeah. You is this nebulous word, right? Yeah. So you're being specific about the noun and yeah. Does anyone need me to repeat that in the microphone? Okay. I forget. Oh, wrap it up. Okay, so Thanks, that's me and Marjorie, Amy June and Marjorie, and um, hey. If you want to do a long version of this workshop, Drupal Camp Asheville is July 7th through 9th, and we're doing a three or four hour version of the workshop yeah, where we brainstorm, hours. we come up with ideas, we help you with your bios and pitches, and it's really great. See y'all there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marjorie.